A Conversation with John Canena is sponsored in part by Venus Travel Incorporated in Chicago, the agency that has served the Chicago land area for over 55 years, which is still owned and operated since 1968 by the Canena family. Again, Venus Travel, the premier agency for over 55 years, is a proud sponsor of A Conversation with John Canena. And now, on to our episode. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of A Conversation with John Canena. Today, we are thrilled to have on one tremendous hockey player from War Road, Minnesota, Henry Boucher, Native American Olympian, Ojibwa. Uh, Henry, of course, is the 1972 Olympic silver medalist and was inducted into the United States Hall of Fame. And we're going to talk about that at the level that he was at. But of course, a former NHL WH player, and like I had mentioned here early on, an Olympian here uh, for the United States. Um, Henry, a pleasure this afternoon to have you on. I followed your career early on, so I'm going to ask the opening question. What's going on with you, young man, today? Well, Jay, uh, uh, thank you for having me on, Joe, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, we just uh, finished up filming a documentary uh, Boucher Films, which I own, uh, partnered with uh, Twin City Public Television and PBS to uh, do a pilot for the Native American Olympian series. And uh, we finished my end of it. We wanted to do mine first because I knew all of the details and and uh, you know all of the specs and what have you. So we uh, have a rough draft right now. We're getting into the uh, you know the uh, I guess the graphic part of it, and you know adding this and that uh, to a final uh, uh, you know product. So we're going to release it in twenty twenty four. Oh wow. Um, Hockey Day in Minnesota is in January 2024, and it's in World this year. Oh, wow. And uh, so it's a, it only makes sense to go ahead and, and release it at that time uh, throughout the community. Uh, World is playing, uh, you know, in an outdoor rink style, like the stadium series. And, um, it's going to be cold. Uh, it's probably going to be 20, 30 below up here. But our uh, World Rosa rivalry dates back, you know, since the beginning of high school hockey. So we'll be playing uh, the Rosa Rams here, uh, you know, statewide television. Uh, oh, wow. And we had several games uh, sure. starting from, you know, Bantams to girls hockey, uh, you know, the boys high school hockey, college, and then, of course, the Minnesota Wild. So it's quite a day here in Minnesota. Uh, we call it the, the state of hockey. And, uh, sure. It's certainly uh, uh, exciting to have it here in, in northern Minnesota, right on the, the 49th parallel, right on the Canadian border up here. Yeah. And uh, on Lake of the Woods. And it's uh fitting, I think, to uh finally have it uh produced and and uh you know, show the, the world that we uh what we do here to make uh state champions. For sure. And I gotta tell you, not not, not to interrupt you, what better person to have been involved with this, but you, and I do mean that sincerely. I got to ask you, um, I know you um, start your career there, basically, in that town. Of course, you are, are legendary from the high school. And uh, I didn't say, I mean, but 
when you were a young kid, do you, does it start the passion uh, for this uh, growing up for the game? Well, I think, you know, I mean, it, it started off with being in a small town. We didn't have snowmobiles. Uh, nobody really uh, ice fished at that time. Uh, we were making our own fun, playing uh, road hockey with his taped up snooze can, uh, you know, trying to skate on ponds and before the river soon froze over. And uh, then we'd scrape off rinks and, you know, all over the community, you know, we'd have uh, up river uh, with different neighborhoods that, you know, run down to shovel their own ice. Sure. Rink off, you know, and then every once in a while we get to play each other. But the World Hockey Youth Program was uh, uh, started off and as a intramural league. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was growing up, we had uh, different sponsors from different community uh, businesses throughout the community that actually gave us, you know, sweatshirts or jerseys. Right. We would play on a Wednesday and then a Saturday. And uh, all of those uh, teams that uh, were in that age bracket basically made up, you know, later on as the Pee Wee team and the Bantam team. And we actually got to wear a uniform. So oh, wow. It was thrilling. And, uh, you know, at that time, we had the World Lakers here who won several national championships, as well as the Allen Cup three times up in Canada. And they played in the Canadian League up there and uh, senior hockey. And they brought in uh, a lot of Olympic players to come up, uh, you know, and play with them during Olympic years and national team yes. years and off Olympic years. And, uh, you know, so they developed uh, quite a program early on. And we kids actually got to go out and, you know, watch and play. Sure. And, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, try to emulate some of their style, of course, and... Uh, you know, we had three ice cream, just making their own fun. And making their own fun, yeah. You know, and that's when we developed their skills, and we would skate. Skate, uh, uh, but besides emulating some of the pros that maybe you just saw on Hockey Night in Canada on a Saturday night, correct? Well, we did on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Yeah. Nights, we had a little black and white TV. <laughs> we could hardly see the pop, but... Uh, you know, if you had your antenna just right, pointed towards Winnipeg, we could pick up uh, Hockey Night in Canada. In <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, a little blurry, but you could pick it up, right? Black and white. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I have to tell you. We enjoyed it. In fact, uh, we had a fundraiser when I was about 10 years old when I was a peewee. And whoever sold the most candy got to go to a... Uh, of uh, our uh, Red Wings and Toronto Maple Leafs game, exhibition game in, in Winnipeg. And then I went out and I saw I was the number one seller. So there was three of us that got to go up there and watch a game. And of course, our uh, Red Wings were, you know, outstanding. You know, that Morty Howe, Ted Lindsay. Lindsay and, and Sawchuck and all them, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, Sacha and all those, yeah, guys. those guys. Henry, that right? Yeah. yeah, Henry. Not to interrupt you. That shows me the passion right there. The way you described it, you know that. You know, here I'm gonna even to sell the candy to go see some of the greatest players in the world. You know, between Toronto and uh, Detroit, which were epic battles, epic battles. I want to kind of go get to this uh, high school career of yours because, uh, you know, even in the high school ranks, you're basically legendary there in War Road. Of course, uh, you guys, um, you had a great high school career. 
And then I see that, you know, in 1969, you're playing for the state championship there. Um, and uh, you lost to a team called the Adina in overtime, correct? That's right. It was, it's called the Adina. Edina. Richard's community is in Minnesota. Um, they developed a program there and, uh, you know, not only in hockey, but in all sports are, they're quite elite. They, uh, surely, uh, represent their section well over there. And it's very, I mean, if you can make it out of the section tournament, um, because it's really a battle, no matter what section you're in nowadays, it is a battle right up to the championship to represent that section at the state tournament. Oh, for sure, for sure, yeah. And then once you get to the state tournament, then it's, it's community pride, it's, uh, it's really something. There's nothing like it to get to that level. Correct, sir. There's nothing like it. Yeah, exactly. Were there NHL players uh, out of Edina that uh, made it to the NHL? Uh, yeah, there was uh, uh, one player that, uh, oh, he was um, playing with a bunch of Canadians. Uh, he went to the University of Notre Dame out of high school and played there. And uh, uh, he was a couple of years younger than me, but I, I did play against him. Was that Nyrop? Bill Nyrop. Bill Nyrop, yeah, I remember it well. Yeah, because he played at the University of Notre Dame. And when you brought that up, I'm trying to think, what Montreal Canadian? And it was Billy Nyrop, yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, there was, and then, of course, you know, Mike Antonovich from Greenway, uh, you know, Coleraine, and several others, you know, over the years, really, uh, sure. really blossomed. So, there's, I don't know how many Division One players that wow. come out of the state of Minnesota and NHL players now. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty, pretty good. Excellent work. We're at the top of your list. Henry, I want to hold up your great book to our audience today. Uh, Henry Boucher, Ijibwa, Native American Olympian, uh, 1972 Olympic silver medalist. And, of course, you are inducted into the um, USA Hockey Hall of Fame. This is a great read for anyone that is uh, This is um, at the halfway point of our podcast, uh, Henry, and what he accomplished and what he accomplished even, you'll see what he does for his community. And this is just a great book. And I, and I love the back of the book, Henry, because it really kind of shows the passion in your face in the back of this book of all the things that you have gone through and how you just took everything to a positive level. This is truly a great read. It's still available. And I got a chance to read it here the last couple of weeks and, you know, thoroughly enjoyed it. So I, I want our audience to know that this is still readily available. After high school, of course, um, you know, your name is out there. And uh, I still never forget 1971-72. You come up to the Detroit Red Wings, and I saw. Yeah, I played after the Olympics. I played uh, the last sixteen games of the Red Wings. My, of course, my favorite team. I remember sitting in the locker room, looking at uh, Alex Dell. Thank you. No, incredible. You know, it was ten years before that that I saw him in Winnipeg. And actually, he's from Thunder Bay, which is up in my area. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, I was in awe of, uh, you know, like Mickey Redman, uh, Gary Bergman, who's from Kenora. Um, you know, some of the other players that you are gone, geez. Yeah. I was watching you guys, and now I'm in a locker room with you guys right now. And Bergman being a great defenseman, Redwin being a winger like you, and, of course, Dalvecchio being the captain of some of those great Red Wing teams after Gordy Howe. When you played with Dalvecchio, uh, I know he was up in age already. Did he still have the skills? He was a little slower, but, you know, he was there uh, 
that's, you know, Sarah Rice uh, and just doing this thing. And he played game after game in and out. Uh, wow. Very seldom missed a game because of injury. But, uh, you know, then, of course, we had Red Johnson and, and uh, Marcel Dion and a few of the other great players that were around at the time. Sure. They were in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, but I got to tell you, Henry, when you came up, and of course you guys, you got this younger crew like yourself, Marcel, uh, Dion, and that. I mean, Detroit starts to make a move in the sense of okay, we're getting some players here now. But I, I, I felt in my brief um, remembering that because I was about thirteen years old at the time, I could be wrong, but I thought they could have had some better coaching there because I think Harkness and the management was starting to make decisions that were not very well uh, done. I think Johnny Wilson was the best coach that I played under. He was there the first two years. And of course, you know, we didn't have, we missed the playoffs uh, two years in a row. And basically, we only had 14 teams. Right. So we had, uh, you know, our division had Montreal, Toronto, New York Rangers, New York Islanders, Buffalo. Uh, the other division had St. Louis, Minnesota. We would have finished second in the other division with the amount of points we had, but we still missed the playoffs. Right. Sure. And I think Ned Harvey is basically ruined that whole yes. system that was horrible. Uh, you know, draft picks. Uh, I couldn't believe some of the number one picks that, that they had playing there that were either in the minors or, you know, they could hardly make that team. And, um, and of course, you know, for Ned Harkness, uh, got fired himself. He, you know, of course, you're going to fire the boat. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, the first one to go, right? Uh, you know, we, we had a, competitive team I mean, yeah. we had uh, we certainly had uh, some good goal scorers we had you know fair goaltending and there was a few spots that could have been filled by uh, more talented players uh, you know I thought uh, especially on defense but we were starting to build a pretty good club and we were respectable and then towards the end, when uh, Harkness uh, hired uh, Alex Galbecchio as the coach, yes. and then uh, he eventually became the general manager, and then that's when I got traded in 1974 to Minnesota. To Minnesota. Which, uh, which I didn't mind at all. And I, I was 23 at the time, and, you know, just starting my career basically i played with red barons and the billy collins and Detroit as a checking line it's a nice checking line yes and so i didn't get a lot of points but tried to keep the other opponents off the board and uh but we started against all of the top lines of the national hockey and uh chasing those guys around you know you really get some experience oh for sure and uh then I went on a, you know, a scoring line uh, later on, and uh, you know, Minnesota, and then that's when that Forbes incident happened. Yeah, which well, I'd like to get to, but I have to ask you. I I thought Minnesota got the better of that deal because you got traded for Danny Grant too. I thought Danny Grant, even though he had, a, I think, one or two good years, uh, uh, he really did not pan out in Detroit. Uh, the way you could have probably panned out in Minnesota, uh, of course, you know. But I just thought Grant, uh, Minnesota got the better end of the deal, in my opinion. Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Danny was a good good goal scorer, but he wasn't, uh, he didn't like to mix it up. He no. He didn't like to go in the corners. No. You know, he'd uh, stand out along the, you know, the dots and lines, sort of, uh, High on top of the circle, and you know, shoot from there. And he had a hell of a shot. Yes, he had, uh, you know, a couple of good years there, and he was older. Yes, and uh, 
I think that was a good choice for Minnesota. You know, we try to build, sure, uh, you know, a team around youth, and and then you know that disaster. Yeah. You know, well, let me ask you something. January fourth, nineteen seventy-five. Let's talk about it. Um, I, you know, here's this guy, Dave Forbes, up and down, uh, miners up, down, you know, up, down. Uh, Boston, of course, had the um, reputation of being a physical team. Uh, with some of the guys they had on that team, I think O'Reilly was on that team. Uh, I don't know. I think Cashman was still on that team. Uh, a lot of those guys. To this day, Henry, I have to tell you, uh, I've watched the video. I've watched it, you know, um, and of course, you know, he, I think the angerment of Forbes comes in because you were a little bit quicker than him. You know, he went to hit you and he missed you and went into the boards. And then, of course, tempers flared and whatever, you threw a few punches. But the fact of the matter remains, it was after the fact of coming out of the penalty box that this man basically assaults you. Did you ever before have any kind of words with this, or did you ever play against him uh, at any one point in your career? The only time I ever talked to him was uh, uh, after I was in the hospital when he called and apologized uh, the next day. And um, I don't recall playing against him after that. Maybe in Kansas City, yeah. And I think he was he was on the team, but he didn't play a lot, so I didn't see him much on the ice at all. So uh, nothing ever came of it. I, I haven't heard from him. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you have to forgive. Uh, you know, that situation, you can't live with it yourself because it'll eat you alive. And, uh, sure. you know, the regret, the, uh, the anger uh, of losing your career over an uh, incident that uh, was unprecedented. Yes. You know, at that time. And uh, it's certainly, you know, uh, give me a bad blow but you overcome all you do but i have to ask you he had you had never played against him before in any kind of junior nothing nothing before that night that game that night no and i you know it came on later that when he was playing with international university that <laughs> um <coughs> Uh, one of the play his opponents knocked him down, and then uh, the guy went after him after Forbes, and Forbes held onto his stick and kind of gashed him a couple of times in the face, and uh, cut him up pretty bad. And that was never reported prior to my incident. Yeah. My incident. But that's the type of player he was. He he was yeah. He wasn't he wasn't that big, but he used those type of tactics to, you know, to remain, you know, a player. And sure. Basically, he was shadowing me the whole game. And and, uh, and that was not do anything. And I you know I, I I took it you know for quite a while. You know his uh, posture his is, uh, you know, they just try to take you out of, off your game. Right. The chirping is... The trash talking, yeah. You know, a little elbow here and there, getting in your way all the time. Um, you know, and then when he finally ran me in boards, or tried to, I had the ability to stop the yeah. you know, I could see him coming, and he, you know, he came over with 10 feet, was really going to nail me, and I stopped, and I kind of jumped back, and he missed me. And that's when I grabbed him and knocked him down. Sure. You know, and then uh, O'Reilly jumped on my back, and he was the third man in to go to the penalty box for two and a five. We're in there for 15 minutes, uh, approximately, because we had to stop. 
before we got back on the island. So when I stepped on the ice, I looked across at Jack Gordon to see whether I should stay on the ice or come off. Gordon was the coach at Minnesota at that time, correct? Right. Jack. Larry Oliver, the head of me, and he says, look out. And I turned around. Folks had uh, already thrown a punch. Uh, and was up, and I could uh, get even feel it, but he had the butt of the stick sticking out of his glove and caught me over the eye. Um, caught me for 30 stitches and blew my cheekbone out. Yeah, and everybody, you know, everybody went to commercial break at that time. Yeah, and then they came back on. And they were saying, well, geez, what happened, you know? And, um, you know, they said, well, geez, maybe it hit his head on the ice or something. And, um, but anyway, you know, blood spurted out about 15 feet after he hit me. So I immediately, well, I was hurt. Sure. Stunned, and I don't know what I was. So, just a little, uh, Unconscious and kind right. of playing, and I just went down and covered up. Yeah, exactly. I, I was because I couldn't do anything. I was stunned. Sure. And uh, then he jumped on my back and grabbed my hair and started pounding, you know, pounding me from the back. And, uh, and that's when you know everybody piled on. Well, oh, then, yeah, Henry. I got to tell you, I mean to come back from that the way you did and the way you did it is amazing for me. I know you even tried to play with the other team in town, the Minnesota Fighting Saints, the Kansas City Scouts. I understood that. But your courage and your passion to try to continue on after that. And I have to be honest. I mean, for something like that to have happened to any of us, the way you exemplified yourself to be this gracious guy that you have to go on and the forgiveness part of it is something that I will never forget as an amateur hockey player, you know, growing up. That was a, that was one of the scariest things to see in the 1970s. So uh, amazing how you had the foresight to move on because that here you are 24 years old. You probably would have been, uh, especially in Minnesota, probably would have been their leading scorer because Goldsworthy had gone. Drew Ann was uh, already traded to the Islanders. They really were depending on you. And like you said, this whole thing just changes the momentum of, of the life. It's just incredible. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm very proud to see all the things that you've accomplished, sir. Well, thank you. It hasn't been easy. No. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> you know, you survive and you continue on. You tell your story and it hopes that will help somebody else down the road. So I do a lot of work with American Indian. Yes. And throughout the country and Canada. Um, you know, as a player and as a you know, indigenous player playing in the, in the National Hockey League and the U.S. born player, uh, you know, it was kind of unique. I, I think, I think, uh, you know, there was, you know, Reggie Leach at the time. Yes. And there was, uh, and there was, uh, um, uh, oh, he's from Winnipeg. He played with the New York Rangers, a big defenseman. Um, uh, we're, we're the only three of us. I think there are three of us that were playing the league of, you know, 14, 14 teams. Right. You know, at that time. And, uh, so we had a lot of, uh, a lot of nice followers that, uh, you know, were anxious to see us play and anxious to meet us and, and to, Try to follow their, you know, our, our, our footsteps, you know, in that direction. And we had, um, every reserve and every reservation in the United sure. States, we had drug and alcohol problems. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's a different avenue, uh, 
to have that discipline and try to uh, base your life on on living a good life and getting an education and sure walking the right road. And 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 again, see, this is the amazing part that. Here now, you're giving back to your community and everything else. I had the chance to talk to, I did an interview with Reggie. I think I, I might have sent it to you also. Uh, I, this is great to know that I didn't know this about you. Uh, two of your uh, distant cousins, Gary Sargent and TJ Oshi, are in the NHL, and I'm sure they looked up to you too as, you know, as being that mentor for them because these were two great hockey players. And I know Oshi is uh, tremendous to watch there. Uh, so again, Again, the the mentorship, even in their mind, of what you went through at the young age, and you know how you persevered in your career is just tremendous. I, I want to hold up the book again, Henry. This is just a great book, the Henry Boucher you Native. Of it on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. A matter of fact, that's where I got it. This is the book, Henry Boucher Ijibwa, a Native uh, um, American Olympian, tells his life story from the days of uh, War Road, of course, and of course, the NHL and everything else. I got to ask you two questions before I let you go, because I know your time is valuable and I really appreciate you coming on. What did it mean to you to be inducted into the United States Hockey Hall of Fame? Well, it was, um, to be inducted, you know, with all of the great players uh, that were ahead of me and, uh, you know, the builders of the game here in the United States, uh, it was truly an honor. And, uh, you know, I was very humbled to, uh, you know, to have that induction in 1995, and, yes. uh, it uh, all that dear to my heart, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, you know all the people that voted uh, me in, and uh, I uh, cherish it today. It, it just amazing when I saw that because for me. Any type of Hall of Fame induction, Henry, is the honor of honors. I never played at the level of a Henry Boucher. I played at the level of the amateur here in Illinois and got inducted here in Illinois uh, hockey as a, a, a Hall of Fame here. And I'll tell you, I still pinch myself, even though it's only yeah. Illinois. Yeah, th thank you, sir. Thank you. I want to leave you with two things that really gave me um, a thrill and a little bit of water to my eyes. Um the first one is, I'm going to read this to you. This is great, you know, coming out of the book. Uh, Henry Boucher was an extremely talented player who possessed a flair seldom seen in hockey. Henry brought a dynamic approach and a charisma to the game that only a top few players have been able to attain. I don't think I have to remind you of who said that. Our 1980 Olympian champion coach, Mr. Herb Brooks, said that about you and uh, that is just a tremendous honor coming from herb because i know you knew herb and this last thing puts the water in my eyes and i think it's you're going to remember this too i often think that people we have loved and who have loved us not only make us more human but they become part of us and we carry them all around all the time whether we see, see them or not and in some way, we are the sum total of those who have loved us and those to whom we have given ourselves. That dedication to Margie Boucher is just beautiful. And um, Henry Boucher, I truly, truly want to thank you for today. I admired you when I was a young man growing up here in Illinois. When you'd come into the Chicago Stadium and check against my Stan Makita and you did a great job. <laughs> and uh, Pitt Martin, I saw some games with you guys. Uh, didn't want you to score off of my idol, who today is two years past Tony Esposito. But you got Tony a couple of times. But Henry Boucher, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored to have had you on today. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, thank you. All right. We will get this out to you here in the public. And again, our thanks to Henry Boucher, U.S. Hall of Fame inductee, and of course, never to forget the 1972 Olympic silver medalist, Henry Boucher is truly is more than a hockey legend.
Thank you, Henry.